Uh, verse 1, let's just read so we get the context here, the intro of the book here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with my, from my forefathers with the pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Now, we got down through all of that uh, last time, uh, actually the last four weeks, <laughs> seems. And uh, the issue with Timothy and the very personal nature of the, the letter now, and as he, Paul talks to Timothy, uh, when he talks there about having the pure conscience, we looked at that issue that Paul had that integrity of the heart, and that even though he was a persecutor of the little flock, he was doing it thinking he was doing the right thing, and that keeps that conscience clear. Then he tells Timothy, I remember you, I cease, uh, without ceasing I have remembrance of you. Uh, he's thinking about Timothy. Timothy is on his mind. He's praying for him night and day, or day and night, night and day. So he, Paul is doing the pray without ceasing edict. And there is um, a great, again, a great, Timothy's on his mind, he's on his heart. So 2 Timothy, this last epistle here, it'll be a very personal epistle between Paul and Timothy as Paul describes the la what the last days of the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ, is going to look like. And he's going to move it from Timothy. It, in, in 1 Timothy, it was all about the local church, the organization, the, the functioning of it. Now it's going to be hey, we're moving now to a more personal level, on a personal basis. And he doesn't defend religious organizations. He doesn't say, keep that. Actually, he's going to tell Timothy the good thing that you're going to keep is the sound doctrine. So it becomes a very personal thing, a very uh, intimate issue. Then in verse 4, he says, and this is where we're going to pick up, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. And, and, and again, he wants to see Timothy, wants to hear about what, how, how it's going, because there's some tears now on Timothy's part. And the, I, I said last time, you, in the work of the ministry, you just being here is great encouragement uh, for everyone, not just for me but for everyone. And when Paul goes to see Timothy, I want to see you, he's looking that he would be filled with joy. Paul is waiting to hear about Timothy and how he's doing and, and, and so forth because he's mindful of thy tears. And there's a struggle that Timothy's now involved in. So in verse 5, he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. He, he's going to call Timothy to remember some things. Because when you get into the message and when you get into the, the, the struggle of the, doing the ministry, there sometimes things begin to kind of die down. Verse 6, he says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. There's a stirring up that needs to happen. So he's going to call Paul. He's, Paul, I want to see you. I, I, I'm you know, wanting to hear about you. I wanna, I'm mindful of your tears. That Those tears are Timothy as he looks around at what's going on in his own ministry, but also with what's happening with Paul. Because where is Paul? He's in that Roman jail. He's in chains. He's, my time of departure is at hand. He, he's not, you know, in the best of circumstances. So that's a concern to Timothy. But Timothy himself is kind of down in the mouth, if you will. He's down. And Paul's going to call to remembrance the unfeigned faith. That issue of the unfeigned faith, that's the real sincere, authentic uh, faith. It's not the fake news. <laughs> it's not the counterfeit. 
It's the real deal. And when he's bringing that back up, and how he does it is by reminding Paul of the people who influenced his life. And you'll notice he does it first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. He calls in grandma and mom. Now, real quickly, you'll notice who's not in the list. Dad. Well, if you come, hold on to here, come back to Acts 16, there is some assumptions then you can make about dad and about the situation. Uh, Acts 16 and verse number 1, Then came he, and that's Paul, to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. Notice how mom is, has a moniker there of being a Jewish and believed. Dad's just a Greek. So as you begin to go, we come back to 2 Timothy, as, as you begin to think about the issue here, there's no mention of dad, so there's an assumption here that maybe dad was an unbeliever, that dad wasn't a believer. Now, we don't know because Scripture's silent, but when you come back to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15, Paul talks to Timothy, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of them, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Notice that from a child, he's known what? The Scriptures. Now, obviously, you have grandma and mom. You don't have dad. There's an indication that dad is not a believer. He's kind of just sitting, he's there, but he's not on, he's not on the scene. So you have a grandma and you have a mom that raised Timothy in the Holy Scriptures. Now, you have... It's an this 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 is a loaded uh, chapter one verse five with grand, with low with mom and grandma is a very interesting thing because it's got some big dynamics to it. In three fifteen, when he says you've learned the holy scriptures, Timothy did not have Paul's epistles growing up. They weren't written yet. So then, what holy scriptures did he have? The Old Testament. So grandma was a Jew. Mom was a Jew, we know that from Acts 16, but what happened when they heard about Paul? They then knew that Paul was the next was the, the right apostle to be involved in, and they moved their son and grandson into that direction. You follow? So that's one of the ramifications there. And, and honestly, I'll be honest with you, the, 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 the scriptures here, the Old Testament scriptures, are very important for you and I to know and to understand. Because look at what it did for Timothy. It made him wise unto salvation. Now, the salvation here isn't the justification issue. It's a salvation issue about what's going on around him and so forth. But note, go back to Romans 1. I, it's just fascinating to me. You know, we, we've had the series Understanding Israel in the evenings, on Sunday evenings and stuff in the past, and because of my job, we've had to stop that uh, and so forth. But look at Romans 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace. You see how Paul just assumes you understand the Old Testament? That's Romans 1.1. 1, 1. He does not say, okay, guys, here, let's have education time about the God of the Bible and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. See how he just, boom. So I know people say, well, why bother with the Old Testament? It's not about us. Yeah, but it's for you, see. And people who begin to kind of, I know grace people who, they only study Romans to Philemon, but the problem with that is, is 
you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you don't have Romans to Philemon, you're stuck, see? And you got to understand all of it. So when you come back to 2 Timothy 1 here, you have grandma and mom raising Timothy, verse 5, 1-5, to be a great leader, to be a great laborer, to be a companion of the Apostle Paul. And they're doing it in a home with an unsaved dad involved. So that is, and by the way, Timothy is a Greek and a Jew mix, which is what the body of Christ is. But what that tells you is that there's no law, not all is lost if one of the parents isn't saved. It's the saved parent doing what needs to be done, which is what? Getting the Bible, getting a verse or two into the kid. And as a parent, and having raised three and still raising three, they don't think I am, but I still am. You know, you, you try to keep, you know, they, they, they take a breath, and in that breath you try to stick a Bible verse in there with them, and you try to train them and teach them. But here's a grandparent also. I, I look around the room, we have, a, we have grandparents. You know, not all is lost. You have the opportunity where mom and dad might be, that you can stick a Bible verse in there and just get them to think about it, you know. And, and it's a great testimony to the impact of a faithful family, a faithful mom, a faithful grandma. They've produced a leader. Now, I know next week is Mother's Day, okay? <laughs> and, and you can have Mother's Day um, and so forth. But the issue here with Timothy, Paul brings that back to remembrance. Remember this, Timothy. Don't, I mean, look, look at your influence, your area of influence, and notice what's going on here and pay attention to it. Because in verse 6 now, he's going to use the wherefore. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Wherefore, because I know who you are, Timothy, because I know that the, that unfeigned faith that was lived in front of you by grandma and mom, it's in you too. I know who you are, Timothy. I know your family history. I understand what you're going through. I call to remembrance. I put thee in remembrance to do what? Stir up the gift of God. Stir it up. Now, the stirring up there is the idea of a campfire. Okay? This past week uh, on my job, I, I, we finished on the 88, or I am. The, the job's not done, but I'm done. They don't need the extra help. So I was in the office, on, I was in the shop, and they bring down cardboard boxes of files to be burned. I'm like, why aren't we just shredding this? Don't you know it's a high pollution day? And I mean, the guy, the, when I said that to him, he's like, what are you? you know? <laughs> just do it, you know? So you got a big 50-gallon drum, and you got a hole in the bottom for air, and you got to build a fire, and you got to get going. And I'm doing that, and I understand that, but what happens when that flame dies down? You just get in there and you begin to stir it up, and what comes back up? The flame comes back up. You know, in a campfire, by the thing about the drum is he brought out a leaf blower, and he set it up, and he turned that thing on, and, and I'm like, okay, and now i got a furnace going, you know, so much for controlling things, you know. I'm like... Great, and then the wind kicked up, and I'm like, you guys are idiots, man. I turned the thing off, and then he came back out. What happened? I go, I don't know, I quit, you know. <laughs> and he's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm burning what you told me to do, man, you know. If you want to pay me 20 bucks an hour to stand here and look at flame, I'll go, okay, go ahead, you know. And he, But uh, anyway, but that's the idea. Stir it up. You get in there and, and get those hot coals going again and, and bring back the flame. Keep it going. He, he's, there, there's, there's some things that are happening with Timothy here now where his zeal for doing the work of the ministry is diminishing. It's dying down. It has died down. If Paul's telling him to stir it up, then things are 
dying down. Verse 4, he's got tears, doesn't he? Look at verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. You see that issue about fear. Verse 8, be that not thou therefore ashamed. You see, Timothy, he, he's, he's going in the wrong direction a little bit here. So th- there's some things that are happening with Timothy that are in, 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 that's, he's beginning to die down a little bit on his zeal, and that's impacting the ministry. Okay, and, and, and it's a, by the way, in verse 7, that idea of fear there is the idea of religious intimidation because that's what's happening here. Next week when we get into verse 7, we'll see that. The, 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 the being intimidated, being terrified, the, the assault, the, the, the intimidation, the shame, it's, it's causing Timothy to come to the point where he's going to, discouragement sets in. And discouragement only knows one word, and you've heard me talk about it, it's I quit. <laughs> That's two words. <laughs> I, the discouragement only knows the word quit. And Paul here, this last epistle, where he's setting forth the pattern of what the dispensation of grace is going to look like, and he addresses the, the first thing off the bat he addresses with Timothy is really the first challenge that comes our way, and that's this issue about being uh, losing the zeal, if you will, shutting up, shutting down, quitting. If you look at verse 13, look at verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. The message has been established. It's there. Now watch verse 14. That good thing, the form of sound words, which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in it. See that issue about keeping? We're to keep it. We're not to let it slip away. We're to hold on to the doctrine. But you know what, though? You can hold on. To, you can have the doctrine. You can hold on to the doctrine, but then you can be intimidated not to do the work of the ministry. And that doesn't do anyone any good. It shuts everything down. And what we're going to see here in Timothy, and Paul talking to Timothy, is that satanic attack on the body of Christ. That goal of Satan to hinder the body, to slow it down, to shut it up. And he attacks in two ways. He attacks the message, okay, And that's to get you to not follow the form of sound words. That is going to get you to change the sound doctrine, chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. It's going to cause you to not rightly divide the word. The goal in all of that is to corrupt the truth. It's to turn the truth of God into the lie. That's That's the goal. And if he can get you to do that, then he doesn't have to worry about plan B, but when he get when you... When you're going to hold and keep the doctrine, then plan B comes up, and that's to attack the messenger. And that's what we're talking about here. The, 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 the attack on the messenger is to intimidate. It's intimidation. And that's, that is, again, that issue of the spirit of fear, of, intim, of, of, of being intimidated, of being ashamed, of being overwhelmed. And that, the goal there is to, it, it's to cause you to back off. It's cause you to shut up. Not talk about the message. Not talk about the doctrine. Not do what you're supposed to be doing. So in verse 6, when he says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift, the overwhelm, the discouragement, the fear, the problems that come up in ministry, the heartache, the intimidation, the assaults, the tears, are all designed to cause you and I to quit, to say enough. We're going to go fishing or go play golf or do whatever you like to do. And that's what's happening to Timothy here. He's almost on the verge of quitting. So Paul says, stir it up, man. Let's get going. Stir this thing up. Let's stir up 
that gift. And what happens with all of that? Uh, come back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. What happens in, in, in the work of the ministry? And, and you know, I, he's not, I know, I know he's talking to Timothy. I know he's talking to leaders. I know he's talking to the pastors, if you will. But he's also talking to you and I as members of a local assembly, as members of the church, the body of Christ. And what happens is, is this, this onslaught, onslaught gets on you and I, and it causes you to not come, not be a part of what's going on, to stop, to say, you know what, I've had enough of it. You know, he, he's, he offended me, or they offended me, or this, and, and, it's, and it's causing you to just be done. And, in, and what happens in all of that is you begin to look at the outward thing. You got 1 Timothy 6. Just turn the page back to 2 Timothy 1. Look at verse 15. Because what happens with that is then you begin to look at things that from, a different, from the wrong vantage point. By the way, look at verse 7, just real quick. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. But what has God given us? He's given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. What do we have? We have a sound mind. We have a proper thinking process, don't we? Now look at verse 15. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from, from me, of whom is Phygelius and Hermogenes. But not all. is all. Timothy isn't turned from Paul. He's under the onslaught. Luke is with him. There's a whole group of guys in chapter 4. So it's that little remnant issue that's there, Okay. But when you, talk, when you think about little remnant, then, and, and you're under the onslaught and your mind isn't functioning right, what then does it look like you are? Weak. See? It looks like you're little. You're insignificant. Now, come back there to 1 Timothy 6, because you begin to look at it this way. Look at 6, 5. Well, verse 3, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So the information given to the Apostle Paul then given to you and I. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt mind. See how you're corrupt? You're, you, you begin to look at things in, the, in an incorrect manner. Then he says, and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is what? Godliness. So now you become a bean counter. Now you become a number. Well, we only had 30 last week. Well, we only had 40 this week. Well, we, now we're down to 10. What's going on here? You guys are... But then you look across the road, and what do you see? You see the big numbers going on. So then you begin to think, well, God's got to be blessing them. And what if you quickly left? That sound mind, haven't you? Because what do we know? We know that God's dealing in the book here, in the mess, in the sound doctrine, not in the number game. You know, hello, Mr. Fly. Okay. So what happens here, come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. By the way, Paul tells you and I, comparing ourselves among ourselves is not wise. And I'll be honest with you, that happens more often than anything else, even amongst ourselves in a well-meaning manner. And, you know, you can't compare us to anybody else because we are us. We're not there. By the way, their gain is godliness, right? That's what we, and Paul, the adoration is from such withdraw thyself. You don't need to be over there. You need to be where you need to be. 2 Corinthians 12, and look at verse number 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. When the ministry, the onslaught, the overwhelming, the, the heartache, the discouragement, the intimidation, when all of that comes in on us, we then begin to look what? Weak. But in our weakness, who then becomes our strength? He does. Because you quit depending upon you. 
you begin to depend upon him. And even though the world out there looks around you and says, oh, they look weak, really, you're not weak. You're strong. Come over to Philippians chapter number one. So the ministry, the, work, the ministry of the grace of God, preaching sound doctrine, standing for right division, standing for the grace life. All right, get a little bit more specific. Standing for who we are in Christ is designed to always look weak. And if you understand that, then when you do look weak, you know what happens? You ain't worried about it. See? If you follow that? Look at Philippians 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. There's the, that's a wonderful church there. These people at Philippi are mature. They're, they're perfected saints. They're mature. They're doing the work of the ministry. They're standing together in one mind, striving for the faith of the gospel. They're doing it. But now look at the next verse. And in nothing terrified by your adversary. The terrorists show up. You know what terrorists, you know what the terrorists do? All they are about is intimidation. That's all they are. Intimidation to shut you down, to shut you up. They're terror, that they're terrified. So here they are, they're out doing the work, and yet what's on them? The onslaught, the, the accusations, the persecution. Finish verse 28, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflicts which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Look, when that's going on, our mindset, the mindset of the sound mind is that, you know what, we don't have the spirit of fear. We have the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. We know what's going on. We understand what's going on. But the adversary's doing it. They're sitting there going, boy, you guys are nuts. You're crazy. Don't you know that God's over down there at the big church in the big building? You know? And I'll be honest with you. If they were honest with themselves and an honest Bible study, they would see that God works small. He never works big. <laughs> he never works in the big. He's always working in the small. You look at Gideon, you remember Gideon? How many men did he start out with? 3,000. Started out with, didn't end with, started with. Yeah, big group. God said, no, it's too big. Whittle that bad boy down. He got down to 300, didn't he? But why is that? Well, what did 2 Corinthians 12, 9 tell us? In your weakness, I'm strong. See, Gideon looked around and said, man, what's going on here? <laughs> we're going we're to lose. God says, no, you're not. You just do what I tell you to do. Follow the word. Obey the word. So when you come back here to first, or 2 Timothy 1, the way that grace operates is it operates in our weakness. So when, when we're looking weak, and that's what he's trying to remind Timothy of here. Don't be discouraged, Timothy. Stir up the gift. You, you need to remember, you need to realize what's going on. And you need to remember that, hey, in, my weak, in your weakness, I'm made strong. And the pressure of the ministry, the, the pressure, the persecution of preaching the word, it does impact your mind, by the way. That pressure does. And it will shake you up. It'll shake your life, and it'll cause you to throw up your hands and say, what's the use? What's the bother? Now come over with me to 2, Tim, 2 Corinthians 2, and I'll show you that issue here with Paul. And it's an issue that we've looked at in the past and we've talked about. 
2 2 Corinthians 2, verse number 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Okay? So we're not ignorant of how he's operating. How does he... How does he want to hinder the body, attack the message? If that doesn't work, go get the messenger. We're going to use enticing words. We're going to use beguilement. We're going to use little devices. Ephesians 6, they're called fiery darts. You know how to handle those. Furthermore, Paul says, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, he goes to Troas. He's, he's established a church at Troas. He's in, he's, the ministry is going gangbusters. It's, it's moving wonderful. But Satan is doing what? He's attacking. He's using, he's using the religious intimidation, the fear factor. Now watch verse 13. I had no rest in my spirit. Because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now, notice something there. What what happened to Paul? Paul is in the middle of, of wonderful advancements in ministry, establishing a local church there at Troas, and what does he do? He leaves. Right in the middle of it, he just leaves. But why? We would call we would call it today that he was depressed. And he was. He found no rest in his spirit. He was struggling with the pressures, with the onslaught that was happening. But he was struggling with it because he couldn't find Titus. Now, you have to remember 2 Corinthians 11, perils in the robber's peril. It wasn't like they could get on an airplane and go from here to, you know, Chicago and be safe. And lately, you're not even safe to do that with the breaking windows and the blowing up tires and all that good stuff, you know. (laughs) Okay? It wasn't that he could get in a car and get there, okay? There was the highwaymen. There was always people laying in wait. Plus, Titus is toting money. He's he's got money involved. But when you... He he goes to Macedonia. Now, come over to chapter 7 and watch where it's going to pick up when he gets to Macedonia. Chapter 7, verse 5. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. See how he, he, he's under the... But it's messing with his mind. He just left Troas. He just left right in the middle of preaching and teaching and getting them established and growing them and edifying them. He just bolts. He's just left town. Why? Because without were what? Fightings. The onslaught. The overwhelming. Within were what? Fears. Within were fears. Inside, he's got the improper thinking going on. He's got his eye off the ball. Now, this is a, by the way, this is a great illustration of the great Apostle Paul that he's just as human as you and I are because we do the same thing. Now, watch the next verse. Nevertheless, God, that comforted those that are, what? Cast down. He's not up in the clouds. He's down in the dumps. See that? Comforted us by the coming of Titus. Titus walks in and says, hey, how you doing? What are you doing here, man? I thought you were at Troas. What's going on? How, you know, and <laughs> verse 7, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoice the more. See, Paul, Titus shows up, Paul, what are you doing, man? You're supposed to be in Troas. I'm coming. You know, and he goes, I just couldn't wait. I'm, I, I, I'm, you, Titus is, Titus is matter of fact, to the point. Paul, knock it off, man. The Corinthians send their love. They send, you know, everything's fine. They're thinking about you. They're praying for you. And what does that do to Paul? It brings him up out of those depths. 
So when you come back here to 2 Timothy, that's what's going on with Paul to Timothy now. As he's trying to bring him up out of this, the, the, the dumps, if you will, the cast down. And he does it by saying, Timothy, all those folks in Asia, they're turned away from me, but I know you and that faithful little remnant of believers there at Ephesus are still good to go. And I'm going to remind you, I'm calling to remembrance that gift of God that is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now, the rest of this verse gets a little tricky. I'm in 1.6. I'm in 1.6. 2 Timothy 1.6. Because of that gift of God thing there, okay? And the putting on of hands. Come back to 1 Timothy 4. So we're going to deal with the verse kind of in a roundabout manner. We're going to back, back into it a little bit. In 1 Timothy 4, verse number 14, we've seen already this issue about the laying on of hands. But we've also seen an issue with Timothy arising already. 4.14. What's the first word? Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Timothy has a tendency to let the gift slide away a little bit. To neglect it. Now, to neglect it is to not keep it stirred up, see. So, Paul, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. The presbytery there, that's the leadership, that's the elders there at the church and so forth. In, in 2 Timothy 1, 7, 1, 6, it's actually Paul himself. So, the leaders working with Paul... They recognize a gift in Timothy. They lay their hands on him. They endorse it. They, 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 that's what the laying on hands. In Scripture, laying on hands, come back to Deuteronomy uh, 34. Deuteronomy 34. Today in our vernacular, and we talk about, we would call this an ordination service, Okay. They lay hands on. They're recognizing what's going on with Timothy. And they're going to move him and put him into a position. Uh, Deuteronomy 34, verse number 9. You have, in Deuteronomy 34, you have the death of Moses. Verse 9, and Joshua, the son of Nun. That's, by the way, the great thing, you know, who had no parents in the Bible? Joshua, the son of Nun. <laughs> okay. He was full of spirit, full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. See how Moses had laid his hands on him? Now that takes place back in Numbers 27. So go back to Numbers 27. Moses lays his hands on Joshua. That signifies something. Numbers 27, verse 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. Verse 23. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. What did Moses do to Joshua? Joshua, you're the next guy in line to be the leader. I'm pa Elijah passes his mantle to Elisha. Moses is passing, he's giving him a charge. He's like, he's re, the laying on in hands is recognizing what's going on and the movement to a new position. This is what's happening, and this is your new position. So in, in Scripture, so when you come back to 1 Timothy 4, verse 14, when they lay their hands on him, the leaders are identifying themselves with Timothy that they are recognizing, notice in verse 14, which was given thee by prophecy, they're recognizing a gift that's going to be given to Timothy of a position. And the position's going to be that of a position of an apostle. Okay, Not the apostle, but a apostle. You understand there's many apostles in the body of Christ Acts 14, Barnabas was an apostle, but he wasn't one of the 12, and he wasn't over here. He was, just, he was 
An apostle is simply a sent one, someone who's been sent and, and with authority. So when you, they're going to identify by the gift of prophecy, the Holy Spirit has given them the ability to recognize Timothy as being sent by God as an apostle. Now, notice, if you will, 1 Thessalonians 1. And, and we're doing this because you, you got to see what's going to happen here. Because when Paul tells Timothy, stir up the gift of God that was given you and put that back in ring, get that thing going, it, it, he's reminding Timothy about, hey, you need to be who you are and remember who you are and remember what God, the job God gave you to do. In other words, grow up, man. It's, let's get on. Let's get with the ball. Let's get with the program. Let's get going. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1. Look at verse 1. Paul and Silvanius and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace and so on. Who, you see the three guys? Paul, Silvanius, and Timotheus. Now come over to chapter 2 and look at verse number 6. Nor of men sought we glory. Who's the we? Paul, Silvanius, and Timotheus. The writers of the book of 1 Thessalonians are Paul, Silvanius, and Timotheus. Now, Paul's the actual author, but that's Paul and Silvanius and Timotheus unto the church at Thessalonica. Okay, of the, I'm sorry, of the Thessalonians. 2 6. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the who? The apostles of Christ. You see how Paul takes Timothy and Silvanius, Titus, and says they're apostles? See how he labeled, he just labeled them an apostle there? You see? That's them recognizing the laying on of hands of the gift of God that was given to him. So though Paul considered Silvanius and Timotheus to be apostles, sent by God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace and mercy, and off we go. So when you come back to chapter one, 2 Timothy 1, 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, what he's doing there to Timothy is he's challenging him, Timothy, you need to remember who you are and the position that God sent you in, set you there. And, and, and this is all designed to get Timothy back on program, get him all revved back up. Now, today, the gift program is ceased. It is done. It is over. By the way, uh, if you look back at 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. That office was a gift off office, the pastors and the teachers. Now it's a what? If he desires. So the gift giving has stopped. So there's no special call to the ministry, see, today. And that's very important to understand because People always ask me, well, who called you to the ministry? And I would say, my wife and my kids, my dad, my friends of mine that I knew at the time. You know, I, <laughs> they're like, no, 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 no. What did God say? It wasn't God saying anything and whispering in my ear. It was the doctrine doing what? Working in me that says, you, got, you need to go, we need to get this going. Follow that? Now, when you talk about the gift of prophecy and the gift of, the gifts, come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You, you, have to, you have to understand that when Timothy, when Paul is writing 2 Timothy, that the gift program is still going because the canon of Scripture is not completed yet. And once the canon of Scripture is completed, then guess what? The gift system stops. It ceases. Okay? Now, the gift system had started slowing down through all of this time. There was a time when Paul healed the man. Remember that? He's on the island, and the, 
and the snake jumped out and got him, and he didn't die, and they thought he should die, and they thought he was a god, you know, okay? But then Paul would go over, and he would send his hanky, his little hanker, napkin, handkerchief, have his little sweat on it, send it in the mail, and the guy would touch it, and he was healed. But then at the end, he, in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, he's going to leave a guy over on Melita sick, can't heal him anymore. So what's happening? The system, the gift system is diminishing away. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. The three main communication gifts that were given by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you come back up to verse number 1, okay, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become as a sounding brass or as a tinkling, uh, tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and so forth. You see that issue about a gift of prophecy? So in verse 8, he's talking about the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and the gift of knowledge. Now he's using these three major communication gifts. By the way, chapter 12 tells you that the gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. If you're out there seeking a gift, it is not a gift, it's something you're seeking. The Holy Spirit is very clear in, in 1 Corinthians 12 that He gave it to whom with all He was going to give it to. Okay, it's very clear. People who don't understand that just simply refuse to read the verses. Okay, that's all that that is. But look at 13.8. Notice it carefully. What's going to happen to these? By the way, He uses these three gifts because these are the three gifts that the Corinthians were abusing because it puts the, puts the people that have these gifts up in front of everybody. And they liked the attention, and they were abusing these gifts. But look at verse 8. What's going to happen? They're going to, they're, the prophecies, they shall fail. So obviously we know that's not the prophetic scriptures, because the prophetic utterances never fail. They always come to pass. So we're talking about the gift. What's going to happen to knowledge? Or the tongues. It's going to cease, and knowledge is going to do what? Vanish away. Eventually, they're going to do what? They're going to stop. Now watch verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. We have partial knowledge. We have partial prophecy. By the way, prophecy is preaching. Yea, hath God said, and letting it fly. We have partial knowledge. Verse 10, but when that which is perfect is come. Now, what's the perfect? Perfect what? Knowledge, perfect wisdom, perfect, complete. When the perfect comes, it's going to do away with uh, what? The partial. Do you see that? You got to follow that. When, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When the complete revelation, the complete knowledge shows up, you know what the gifts are going to do? They're going to stop. They're going to cease. So today, we have the completed word. When Paul puts his pen down at the end of 2 Timothy, guess what stops? All of the gift stuff. Okay? Now, what happens now in this passage is people run down to verse 12 and they say, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face with Jesus I will behold him. And they get the songbook religion out. Nowhere in this chapter, nowhere in this section is he talking about seeing Christ face to face in heaven. That comes out of a songbook that we sing, and we let songbook religion, theology, invade common sense. My question, if you think that is the way it is, is why in the world would the Lord and the Holy Spirit and God the Father write a book, 13 books, of which 
all but five chapters are about you living the grace life and growing to maturity and edifying what he's saying that you got to wait till you get to heaven to be perfect and complete. He wouldn't have done that. He would have done what? Wrote the first five chapters of Romans and said, then go live your life. And when, by the way, when you get to heaven, you'll be completed out and we'll go from there. doesn't make sense. Because when you read the other 99.5% of Paul's epistles, it's all about life and living and the future and that what you're doing today is impacting the future. So he wants you to do what now? Grow up. He wants you to do what now? Come to perfection. Come to some understanding. Now come over to Ephesians 4. So when we talk about the gifts, and, I, and I, by the way, I'll tell you, this summer, I, I, last year we started a summer series and, uh, um, on Paul using the Old Testament and we're, I was going to go back to that, but it's dawned on me that looking through things, we haven't talked about some of these hot-button issues in, a, in, in years. So we're going to do that in our summer series, the gifts and, and different healings and different things, because it's important, it's critical that you and I, un, we speak the same thing, and we, and we have an understanding that, of what we're talking about. If, look, look at Ephesians 4. Because when you talk about the gifts, people get emotionally stirred up real quick. Because they have songbook religion, and they got a theology that's been brought in out of the charismatic movements. And when, when you look at that, and when you come to Scripture and just simply read the verses, you real quickly understand that that stuff is not right. There's something wrong. Okay? I got five minutes to do an hour's worth of stuff, so we're going to go do this real quick, okay? Verse 7, Ephesians 4, 7. But unto every one of us is given, gra is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So there is a point when after his ascension, up far above all heavenly places and principalities, Ephesians 1, what does he do? He gives gifts to men, it's only men, specifically in the running and the, and the maintaining of the, and the getting things going in the body of Christ. Verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. 1 Corinthians 12 about verse 28, 29, these gifts are listed again as the administration gifts of the local assembly. He gave. Why did he give them? Verse 12. First word, for. Here's the why. The end, for, the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. How long were they given? Till. There's a time element. There's a time issue here. There's an there's a expiration date on the gifts, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure, the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're going to have those gifts until we come to the unity of the faith. Now that's not back there about keeping the unity of the Spirit in verse 3. This is the unity of the faith. This is a completed word of God. The scripture is complete. So we have the completed word that's now going to do what the gifts were doing. It's now going to do it all for you. Now, we don't have the time to go back to 1 Corinthians 14 and, and see that, but we do have the time to run to 2 Timothy 3. Hold on to Ephesians 4. Run to 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. Because in, first, in Ephesians 4, verse 13, he talks about unto a perfect man, a maturity. We have the completed revelation about everything that God is doing in and through His Son. If you think the gifts are still going, then you believe in, a, in an issue that um, I call continuing inspiration. God is continually to speak, and you better be writing it all down because it's God's Word. 
You either believe he's done it all already, or you don't. First, Second Timothy 3, verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be what? Perfect. What is, what is, how is perfect defined? Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Mature. Maturity. Now you see that. The Scripture is designed now to do what the gifts were designed originally to do. Now I want you to notice something. Hold, you got, take your 2 Timothy 3.17, fold it over, look at Ephesians 4.12. The gifts, he, by the way, verse 11, and he gave, so past tense. He is not giving, he gave. What did he give? Apostles, prophets, by the way, know the plurality, know this, the plurality of them, okay? Pastors, teachers, evangelists. So in other words, there's room for Timothy and Titus and the guys to be apostles. Not the apostle, but subsequent Apostles. They were given, verse 12, that's why I went, for the, for the what? Perfecting of the saints. Well, what does the Word of God do in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? It perfects the saints, doesn't it? It's there for the, for the doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. Those are the key, those are the key elements of, edifi- of the edification process. Give you the doctrine, reprove you, correct you, instruct you. That's the edification process. What does that do? What does the edification process do to the believer? It perfects them, matures them up, grows them up. Then they're going to do the work of the ministry, aren't they? Well, what does 317 say? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all what? Well, what's the good works? Doing the work of the ministry. See? Well, who accomplishes that in 316? The Scripture does. For the edifying of the body, well, there's the edification issue again that the Scripture is going to do. As you grow and as we begin to move and as we grow up, what happens? The body as a whole is then edified. So when you come back to 2 Timothy 1 here, The scriptures today do the jobs that the gifts were doing. So the word comes along and has replaced that temporary system. That's why in 1 Corinthians 12 at the end, he'll say, I'm going to show you a more perfect way. You notice that verse? 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 31 but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Sorry, excellent way. Well, what's a more excellent way? The completed scriptures are, rather than the temporariness of the gift-giving program. 1 Timothy 1, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 1. So again, the scripture does for us today what the gifts were doing back there, And today when the Scripture, the Word works in the believer to motivate them to to do what they're personally committed to do, uh, equipped to do, sorry. And you're going to get that done through the Word working in you that believe. Effectually working in you that believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. What Paul is doing in 2 Timothy 1.6, Timothy is under the onslaught of the adversary, of the persecution. He's ashamed. He's got tears. People are leaving for the things that the gain is godliness. Boy, God's over there now doing. Sorry, Tim, but you're a great guy. We love you, but we're going over here now, you know. And Paul is just simply, Timothy, remember who you are and remember the gift, the position that God set you in. Stir that bad boy back up. Let's get on with it. Now he's not done because we'll pick up in verse 7 because he's going to remind him about what God has given us and hasn't given us, okay? Uh, Time's up, (laughs) okay? And everybody goes, okay, good, finally, (laughs) all right? But the issue here in this is 
Ministry gets tough. It gets tough not only for me, but for you guys as well. Of, hey, you know, we're doing. But then all you have to, what, stir that thing? Carry on. Stir it up. Stir it up. Get motivated. Get moving. And uh, that's uh, the great exhortation here. Okay? We'll pick up verse 7 next time, I hope. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for the folks that are here, for their commitment to the word, to the sound doctrine, to studying, to learning, and to doing the work of the ministry. In your name we pray. Amen.